and welcome to Gods and Movie Makers, otherwise known as Pod Bless You, Everyone, the show about how religion and the Bible shape the stories we tell on screen. I'm Katie Turner. And I'm Jake Scouts. On this holiday episode, the tree is trimmed, chestnuts are roasting, and Santa's on his way. But are the movies we enjoy this time of year strictly secular, or are they rooted in the religious aspects of the holiday? Ho, ho, ho. Now on with the show. (laughs) Okay. Good. Okay. Oh, it's ridiculous. Perfect. We're joined today by Dr. Chris Deasy to talk about the modern classic Elf. Chris is the Director of Studies for the School of Culture and Languages and the course lead for Philosophy, Religion, and Ethics at the University of Kent. Since 2018, Chris has been hosting a weekly podcast called Nostalgia Interviews with Chris Deasy. Chris has also presented a six-part BFI-funded documentary called Generation Y about religion, spirituality, and ethics, which explores young people's views about faith and culture in the UK today. Chris's latest book is Christmas as Religion, Rethinking Santa, the Secular, and the Sacred. In sum, he is the perfect guest for our Christmas movie episode. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much, Kate and Joe. Good to see you both. Nice to see you too. So a lot of people complain each year about how early they see Christmas stuff appearing in shops or hearing Christmas songs on the radio. So if you were in charge of the world or the scheduling and could put a limit in place on when this kind of things begin, when Christmas can officially begin, when would that be? And actually, that's such an important question, because the run up to Christmas is considerably longer than the post Christmas period, Mm. which we still call Christmas. But it's like the Scrooge story, which ends on Boxing Day. And of course, we then have to fathom what's going to happen afterwards. So in answer to your question, I mean, officially, when you get to the beginning of November, even before bonfire night and just after Halloween, that's when the shops go crazy and all Mm. the decorations are up and you can buy your festive Christmas lattes and and sandwiches and so on. And we always complain that it feels too early because we we haven't got over other sets of cultural Mm -hmm. rituals. But I've noticed this year particularly, because we're recording this only, what, 11 days into December. It kind of feels, it's the old adage that Christmas comes earlier and earlier. People have been posting their Christmas trees on social media from, Mm -hmm. in some cases, the middle of November, maybe even slightly earlier. So uh, whereas once upon a time I would have said, well, not before the 1st of December, I'm Mm -hmm. inclined now to say that realistically, as long as you don't go sort of back before the middle of November, I think that's kind of within the window that we now see as as an acceptable part of the, the, the Christmas calendar. In 2019, I actually took note of when the earliest Christmas song I heard in a co-op was, and that was 24th of September. So pretty early. So that would be the sort of first week of the university term. That's our like, mm. welcome week, our freshers week. Far too early. That's far, far, far too early. We're still talking about summer. We're saying to the students, did you have a lovely summer? What did you do? And of course, the evenings are still reasonably long at, the, at, at that mm. point to be talking about Christmas parties and, you know, end of term and setting deadlines for essays just before Christmas. It, it, it all feels rather sort of anomalous, but, but you've put your finger on it, I think, which is that mm. the, the build up to Christmas is extensive, but crosses other cultural moments, other rites of passage. And I mm. think that is crucial to this, that Christmas almost sort of uh, drives over and kind of subsumes other calendrical non-Christmas events. And, and kind of imbues them with this sacred quality. It sort of mm. uh, whitewashes, literally, through the snow, all of our celebrations. We're going to get on to lots of the kind of things you've raised and to get us in the mood to talk particularly about the film Elves. I'll do a brief synopsis of the film. My finger has a heartbeat. Don't hurt so much after a little. What's your name? Buddy. I'm Carolyn. Hi. What do you want for Christmas? A sissy talks a lot. I'll put in a good word with the big man. Thanks. Your costume is pretty. Oh, it's not a costume. I'm an elf. Well, technically I'm a human, but I was raised by elves. Oh, I'm a human. Raised by humans. Hmm. Cool. Elf is a 2003 film starring Will Ferrell as a 6 foot 3 30 year old man buddy who has lived his life in the North Pole believing that he is an elf. His true parentage is revealed to him as he struggles with integrating into elf society and this revelation is given to him. 
Unfortunately for Buddy, on top of this, he's told his unbeknowing biological father, Walter Hobbs, played perfectly by James Kahn, is on the naughty list. Heartbreaking as this is, Buddy is undeterred and he sets off for the Big Apple to find his father and figure out his place in the world. Along the way, he meets a girl, finds a family and shares the Christmas spirit with everyone he meets. The supporting cast is truly spectacular, including Ed Asner as Santa, Bob Newhart as Buddy's adoptive father, Papa Elf, Zoe Deschanel as Jovi, Buddy's love interest, Mary Steenbergen as Buddy's stepmother, Emily Hobbs, as well as appearances by Amy Sedaris, Andy Richter, Peter Dinklage, Faison Love, Michael Lerner and John Favreau, who incidentally also directs the film. It's just delightful and I had a great time revisiting it after quite a long time not seeing it. So I think most people if they were asked around Christmas films might have this concept of a secular Christmas film. Even though it's about Christmas, Elf perhaps could be put in this category because there's not really any mention of God or Jesus, the nativity, and nobody in the film professes a specific belief or set of beliefs. Although we do see some nuns in the film. But before we interrogate this idea further, it might be worth just discussing the basic premise. So there's a widely held idea that the secular and religious are these two separate categories. So we want to ask for your take on this particular framework. Absolutely. And, and, and you've hit the nail on the head because the, uh, Christmas movies are sort of a genre in their own right. When I wrote the book Christmas as Religion, this is what I was trying to explore. It's the, it's the ultimate paradox of Christmas, that people are celebrating something that for some people, of course, it's all about the nativity. It's all about Christianity. But that's not ostensibly really what people are actually doing. And when people put up those decorations that we were just talking about as early as November and listening to those Christmas songs, it's very difficult to sort of make the case that that's, you know, a sign of Christian cultural dominance, because those films themselves seem to be far more, shall we say, nuanced or or, or certainly secular in, in at least the way that they present themselves. For me, what I would say about Elf, it falls into the tradition that certainly goes back to Ebenezer Scrooge and the, you know, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, the notion of the outsider who at Christmas is able to reconnect with family. And of course, in this case, it's the family he didn't know he had, because the family that he thought he was, he was he's a human living in a world of elves, but, but didn't realise uh, until he actually yeah. encounters real humans, uh, that actually he, he doesn't quite belong in, in the environment that he considered at home. It's sort of mixing that with It's a Wonderful Life, where you've got the estranged man who thinks he is unloved being the glue that keeps the community alive. And certainly the Scrooge thing with the misanthrope who's alienated from his true nature, although I think that particularly applies to James Kahn's character here, the, 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 the mm. father, who undergoes a transformation in his very mode of being and spreads the very cheer that he'd hitherto despised. So there are some mm-hmm. very clear tropes around Christmas, which are intrinsic to this film and all the other sort of Christmas films, which are not incompatible at all with the Christian story, and maybe even could be said to dovetail with it, but could hardly be said to be front and centre of this. So it's got its own alternative inverted commas mythology. So would you say that when we are thinking in terms of this category over here is religion, and this category over here is secular, that actually there is more of an overlap than people tend to think that there is. You see this in this film here because at the end, of course, it's all about the bringing of Christmas cheer. I mean, it's got the magic, the Mm -hmm. supernatural. You've got Mm -hmm. the reindeer and the sleigh and this whole notion that until the people in New York City start developing the Christmas spirit, then the Christmas sleigh is not going to be able to ride. I mean, this is the thing that I always find really ironic, that many people who might say that they have no interest in, that they don't follow or understand or believe in the Christmas story... uh, will actually espouse supernaturalism, belief in magic, in a secular context. So Christmas films are full, of, are redolent in uh, supernaturalism. That yep. The object of the supernatural is this more sort of secular motif. I would actually argue that actually it's no less uh, sacred in its own way, but it's, it's a different way into it. So it's like people have a problem with the Christian story, but at Christmas they still need the magic and the supernatural. They just find it through a different kind of means. The whole notion of the community, the spreading of Christmas cheer, what goes on in Elf uh, in Central Park, uh, and, and all these sort of quite alienated people sort of come together over Christmas and they spread this Christmas cheer. That's hardly incompatible with the Christian story. Mm. Can I ask you to speak a little bit more about Santa as sacred? 
Yeah, I mean, this goes all the way back to, you know, the, the whole tradition around St. Nicholas. You see it in the 19th century mm-hmm. and the, the Clement Clark Moore poem. You've got the obvious sort of thing that Jesus brings one set of gifts and Father Christmas brings another. There's something obviously very traditionally materialistic about Santa in the sense that he brings actual presents. And there's something very consumerist about what he offers. But actually, he's the agent in a lot of these films for a change of character, a change of spirit. He's, he represents the sort of the old, the old school values. You see it in Miracle on 34th Street when he's like, the world is getting a little bit too busy. And so there's that mm-hmm. sort of sense of what are our priorities? And Santa embodies those. So it's the paradox there that on the one hand, he's this figure of material giving. But on the other hand, he's also a figure who's very aware that Christmas itself has lost its way. Santa Claus, the movie, which I was only watching last night at the cinema, is another one. It's sort of all about that sort of notion that Father Christmas, you know, has to think about what are his objectives. And it's about ensuring that every child is catered for. And it's bringing a whole sense of virtue. It's bringing almost a value system to the Christmas canon. So it's not just the the giving of gifts. There's a criteria. There's a sense of deserve in all of that. And it has its own moral universe within which, you know, Santa operates. There's one Disney film from 1985 called One Magic Christmas, where Father Christmas raises the dead. Hmm. He is the God figure, Jesus figure. Yeah, Mary Steenburgen actually is in that film as well. But it uses those tropes there. You know, Lapland and heaven become interchangeable. And it becomes that sort of place where people go after they die. And then you sort of, you know, the the making of presents for all eternity for all the children becomes this sort of central site for for that. So it's, it's funny how the the Christmas universe in films has its own integrity. But it's it's something that is both divorced from, but also I would argue the other side of the same coin as the Christmas nativity story. There's like a underlying logic of how this things function and some of the values and the ideas and the ways in which this category of belief is somehow really, really important for in Elf as well, how Santa Claus operates. That is just underneath all of this is a Christian construction of how the sacred works or ideas of what belief is about. We can be swept up in this as a universalist thing, but it is also very particular and only really works as an outgrowth of these very Christian ideas around the meaning of Christmas is such like a a strange thing. And then it becomes this dual operation where, as you pointed out, it's very consumerist in some ways and represents that, but really ultimately these kind of values of belief and belonging and being a part of this group become revalued and redeployed somewhat over these material gifts and it's it's also in good behavior that the material gifts themselves are given constructed in a very very particular way i think you you put that really well because you've got this sort of sense of the the boy really who's in search of his father you know at the end of the Mm. day he he wants to be reconnected with family and his father doesn't recognise him, but he never gives up. I mean, there are obvious parallels there in that sort of notion of somebody who's trying to please the father and and perhaps has been betrayed by the father, but actually he ultimately is saying, well, let's try and make this work. And, and he brings such innocence and such cheer that the father, of course, is bowled over by this because he doesn't work in a, in a universe where sort of good things really happen and where people actually behave. He's a cutthroat person who works in a, in a, maybe in a Christmas industry, but he, all he cares about is, is profit and the, the, the bottom line. And so suddenly bringing in that personal angle, he's reconnecting with his own youth and, and this woman that, with whom he uh, fathered a child. And suddenly, like with the Scrooge story, he's sent on this journey himself of, of reconnecting with something that he'd lost. So, so it's that prelapsarian notion, I think, that is so key to these films. Because in all of these films, you've got the misanthrope. In the case of Elf, he, he's not the main character. It's the, the central character who is the agent of change. And then it's the father who then undergoes this, this journey, facilitated mm. by the, the, the innocent, not quite of this world, almost sort of like Edward Scissorhands type figure. And, uh, and, and in so doing, changes all of their lives. And it's the way that family almost is the end of this. And maybe all the money and the finance and the giving of, of presents and so on is a means to that end. But it's the sacrality of family that I would say is core to Elf. I would like to pick up on some of the things that you've touched on a bit around, I think both of you mentioned, around consumerism and Christmas. And I definitely think there is this sort of general discourse in culture, right, that Christmas has become too consumerist. And we can definitely point to some Christmas movies where consumerism 
is appealed to and at the heart of them. But I think a lot of Christmas movies actually work against that. In It's a Wonderful Life, capitalism is embodied by Potter and that's all bad. And George Bailey runs so much more. He's so much more driven by charity and morality. And that comes out on top at the end of the film. And the really recent Netflix animated Klaus, which I think is just a beautifully done Christmas movie. There is some consumerism going on, but the character who's driving that is changed through the movie. And the gifts that are being given out are, this is charitable giving. It's if gifts that are being made and then distributed to children. And I think Elf does that as well. How do you understand the drive against consumerism that is present in in so many Christmas movies? And that is the paradox, because these films are often criticised and given very low ratings. One star ratings is very sort of commonplace. I remember Empire magazine giving Jingle All the Way back in 1996 a one star rating, mm-hmm. saying that effectively it's, it's, it's got all the worst excesses of Christmas. But mm-hmm. when you unpack it... This is exactly the thing. It uses capitalism, commercialism, consumerism, and that sort of drive. It's really about a man who wants to reconnect with his son. And the way that he shows his love for his son is still getting this turbo man action sort yeah, of goal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is important because Russell Belk, anthropologist, who did a survey in a North London uh, shopping area back in 1994, and he said that when people go shopping, it's always other directed. So it's that sort of notion that people are shopping not for themselves. It's the way that they show their love for somebody who matters to them, their their loved ones, their children, etc. So the more that they spend, it's, it's a way of manifesting their love. And I think if you apply that to the Christmas context, then, and Russell Balk has, has written on Christmas, then I think you get to the heart of this, because on the surface, yeah, you've often got these big, expensive houses, you've got these rich families, that's often the think of home alone. You know, there's always that notion of opulence in all of these films, that the, that the characters mm-hmm. very often seem to have a lot. It's like, you know, they're, they're Christmas homes, it, it's the dream. But there's something in here where it's all a means to an end. And I think that sometimes the reviewers are very keen to sometimes say, yep, this is this is Christmas materialism, but it's worse. I don't deny that these films are made for money. These films are made for profit. Mm. So, of course, mm-hmm. that's the ultimate irony that, you know, they, they may have a message there about the importance of family and love. But these films do have at their core this notion of, a, of, of what it means to be a neighbourhood, to be a, a family. Christmas with the Cranks, another example about secular nonconformism based on a John Grisham short novel. Uh, they, they want to get away for Christmas, but they're not allowed because if they do get away, then actually they're going against the whole grain of having the biggest, most ostentatious Santa on the, on the rooftop. And it's all about this sort of, you know, everyone, even the, the local Catholic priest, uh, they all sort of come together on Christmas Eve to sort of celebrate what exactly? To celebrate what? Christmas that's divested of its traditional religious elements and everyone, including the Catholic priest, is, is shoehorned into this neighbourhood secular Christmas, which is all about the great, having the great uh, frosty on the rooftop. But there is this element here of a people coming together. And if you take that away, if you do something nonconformist, if you do something errant, then you're ostracised. And I think that that is the staple that runs all the way through these Christmas films, which give you miracles along the way, give you magic. You have you know, flying Santas uh, and sleigh rides. But at the heart of it is this notion of family and love. I'm thinking here also along these lines of you've talked about the particularly that Christmas with the Cranks example, where every year they have the largest Santa in the neighbourhood. And there's this sense of repeated, this is what you do at Christmas. This is a repeated activity that takes place every year. And I'm interested in exploring a little bit how we can think of this as ritual, both within the context of Christmas films, which surely reflect what people are doing in reality as well, but then also our practice of re-watching Christmas films and <laughs> other Christmas media as well. I feel I'm slightly unusual in not, not necessarily doing this that often, but there really is a certain rhythm to things that you revisit and they recall a certain sense of your your own created tradition. Just to interject before you answer, I really appreciated there's a bit of your book where you talk about the sort of ritual rewatch. I, unlike Joe, very much do ritually rewatch a certain small selection of films each year. I appreciated your talking about that and now you could share it with our listeners. <laughs> Absolutely. No. I, 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 see, I remember going to see Christmas with the Cranks in Christmas 2004. 
And, and I knew it had the one star review. It's one of those guilty pleasures where you know you're watching something that, you know, on, on any aesthetic scale, it's not going to win any Oscars. But there was something in it that appealed. And, and at the same time, I, I remember preparing some classes. I was teaching a course, still do, called Death of God. And we were looking at lots of 19th and 20th centuries approaches to myth. Rudolf Bultmann, Don Cupid, that sort of notion that, oh, in the world today, we, we believe in science. We don't believe in myth. And it's one of those things that need to be divested if we're going to move on, if religion is going to, if God is going to make any sense in a postmodern context. And yet you watch a film like Christmas with the Cranks and you think, well, the, the Don Cupids and the Rudolf Bultmans and their problem with myth don't make any sense anymore because people are crying out for that. Now, I suppose you could argue on the one hand mm-hmm. that this is not a film that may be the, the greatest barometer in a way that Elf certainly is of Christmas. But there is something that they both have which is this sense of community and the sense of coming together and revisiting, you know, what, what is this notion of the perfect Christmas? Can it be attained? Can you, you know, can you get it back? And you, I mean, you have it in Elf with all those Christmas crooners all the way through it, Andy Williams, Louis Prima, Frank Sinatra. It's harking back to this golden age. So there's something very ritualistic about this at the very heart of these films. Now, what I'm interested in is that these rituals are undoubtedly sacred and they are religious, but I'm not for a minute claiming that they are exactly the same thing as what goes on in a more traditional Christmas nativity setting. But I kind of feel that they have a lot in common. I suppose it's the equivalent of having a Christmas store display. You know, would you put Jesus and Santa together? That They have their own in some ways, maybe quite competing cultural mythologies, religious mythologies, but you don't really put them together. In Home Alone, isn't it interesting that young Kevin prays to Santa? Yeah, but from in a church, right? Yeah, yeah. in a church. I mean, it's fascinating. It's bizarre. Yeah. I think afterwards he goes to church, and you're right, then in, in, back in the house, um, he, he seems to offer some sort of a prayer to Santa, and he writes a little note, and then the next morning his family come back. But it's got all those ingredients. It's kind of juxtaposing and commingling them, but in such a way that you don't actually have the two of them together in the same space. But they're there in different places at different times. So Home Alone is a very, quote, secular film, but also has a very key scene set in a church. What you said about Elf is very interesting that it doesn't have any sort of churches as such, but it also does have a very clear sense of tradition in it. And, mm-hmm. and, and mm-hmm. that is, I think, the paradox that I'm interested in trying to, to get to the heart of. It's such a good point that you don't see Jesus and Santa together. But I think Santa in so many places is filling in. He's symbolic of these aspects of of Christian belief. And I think that's really present in Elf because we do hear throughout the film language of belief about the dipping of belief in the broader culture and how that's a problem and we need more people to believe. And that is encouraged through the film. And then at the end, when you have Papa Elf played by Bob Newhart, Going back to the voiceover, the movie begins with him giving a voiceover and ends with him giving a voiceover. And he talks about how Buddy saved people. So there's even this salvific, Mm. explicitly stated aspect. And the thing that I always find troublesome about Christmas or frustrating about Christmas films is, of course, they end on Boxing Day I mean, or, or New Year's Eve, but, mm-hmm. but they're very calendrically limited because we started the conversation by talking about how the run up to Christmas gets longer and longer. But Christmas never goes into February, March, April. Now, this is something with the Scrooge story. I always think if, if the Scrooge story was, was being retold now, I can almost imagine sort of starting on Boxing Day. And then sort of what happens afterwards, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm intrigued by that kind of flipping because the thing that, of course, is at the heart of A Christmas Carol is that on Christmas Day, Scrooge is a new man. Mm-hmm. And on Boxing Day, of course, he has a bit of fun with that because he starts by telling Bob Cratchit effectively, you know, oh, I've got to dock your wages. And he says, you know, I'm only joking. But after that, is Scrooge redeemed, which is a very big Christian term, is he redeemed forever? Or does he then revert to self as a misanthrope, right. but then the next year go through the whole process over and over again? Mm. Now, of course, there is no answer to that because it's that's for us to read into it. But that's the bit that interests me. I always think, great, but what happens afterwards? And, and it, is that redemption just for Christmas? Is it that sense that even if it doesn't work out and, and you don't get the perfect Christmas, is there still that notion that, you know, next year you'll have a chance to have another crack of the whip and you can go through it all over again? Or is this transformation forever? 
is Scrooge permanently changed by this story? And and that's the bit that, of course, isn't answered, and which I think is 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 the missing link. It's funny because you were talking about Darwin, but that's the missing link yeah. in these films, that they always end at the same point. I'd be much more interested in a filmmaker who wanted to use that as the starting point rather than the end point. Yeah. I think it's one of the things I like about Elf is that you get this little flash forward because we see them at the very end. We see Buddy and Jovi visiting Papa Elf in the North Pole and they have a baby with them. So you know, okay, we're talking like at least a couple of years from Mm -hmm. where the rest of the action left off. And we also see that little flash forward about the fact that Walter Hobbs has started his own independent publishing company and he's had success with this first book. And so we're getting this future where those changes have remained. But I think you're right that most Christmas movies leave it with, I guess, hope, right? The desired happy ending in which everybody has turned back to belief and everybody has gone back to this traditional or however the movie is imagining what a traditional believing society is like. Hmm. And it can't be a criticism of Christmas films only because the Shawshank Redemption, originally the ending was going to end on the uh, on the bus towards Zaywatanea rather than the Zaywatanea mm-hmm. itself. And arguably it's a better film or some people, depending on how you look at it, it's a worse film by actually concretizing that redemption. Yeah. But you're right, it's the hope, it's the belief. And that is the heart of this. Because once you've got that sort of notion of hope and something magical has happened, that has to be the point at which you end. Because otherwise the whole build-up is that there's been some transformation. Mm. But even Bad Santa... Um, I'm looking forward to seeing it again this evening because even that does end maybe on an ironic note, but it ends on a far more positive note that's in keeping with all the other Christmas films. The formula is unchanging. Yeah, I'm interested if there is any filmmaker out there who would have the guts to do something where that is deconstructed. Yeah. Thinking about this idea of not knowing what will come next, I can see two trajectories of this. And one is, are there any really good Christmas sequels? Because so many sequels, they have to reset the character growth to retell basically the same story. And that collapses the problem. So then you just don't get a satisfying film. And then does this also lend into the repeating behavior? So you undergo the same growth, this real almost conversion narrative. There's often this character who needs to undergo a moral transformation. The outcome is that they've done it. And then you rinse and repeat every year and you, as an audience, undergo this transformation with them. Oh, what a brilliant question. Two films that come to mind, Home Alone, because that just completely gives you the same formula. Yeah. I think I think yeah. as the Home Alones go on, admittedly, I'm not familiar with all of the later ones, but certainly the second one is also set in New York and over Christmas. But Die Hard is the other one. The first two Die Hards, of course, were were almost the same template. They're both set on Christmas Eve. Uh, But then the third one, of course, is set in the summer and then also doesn't function like a normal Die Hard film anyway because it brings in a different character, the sidekick, Samuel L. Jackson. So so in that sense, there is a a move away from from that kind of formula. But yeah, it is the the rinse and repeat element Mm. that, that I think is core. Die Hard and Die Hard 2, Die Hard, Home Alone and Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. You know, to be honest work as well as they do because they give you the same formula Mm. it's clearly the same character in a different situation faced with a different challenge but lead to the same conclusion family Mm -hmm. ultimately do you think that the fact that these characters kevin McAllister and uh john mcclain that they both have to kind of go through the same redemption arc do you think that if you know that because you've watched the second ones that that diminishes at all the first film yes i i think that's the risk i Mm. I think that in both cases, the first films tend to work so well on their own that you can almost forget that there was a more, shall we say, jaded or a more sort of, you know, formulate sequel. But the formula is so powerful that it can withstand the mythology around both of those films. It it can withstand any, any, any attack. I mean, actually, Back to the Future, I know we're moving off Christmas films. But um, often the second one is often seen to be the weakest in the trilogy. But actually, in some ways, it's the most inventive because it has the whole yeah. flash forward, flash back. Right. But interesting that those Home Alone films found a formula and they, they very cleverly stuck to them. Well, at least to begin with anyway. Mm-hmm. So do you think that there is a space then where we could have sort of doubting Thomas doubt a second time and it still maintains its uh, oomph as a story? Yeah. And it's actually blatant because because the second Die Hard film is it's not a bad film by any means, but it but it follows mm. the same formula. But that is the whole point, because all Christmas films follow the same formula, whether they're right. sequels 
So even though we're comparing the other Die Hard film or the other Home Alone film, what they're doing is no different from so many other Christmas films anyway that, that, that aren't part of that sequel. So I think the formula outlasts. The formula is almost the, the, the glue that holds them all together and they can withstand some uh, weaker, pale imitations. If you had to give a really brief summary of what that formula is, so our listeners could take away and be like, okay, this sentence or two is what the formula of a Christmas movie is. Could you do it? Okay. The formula is an outsider figure, somebody who's alienated from their past, from their family, is given a chance, specifically on Christmas Eve or thereabouts or Christmas Day, to become a better person. And it changes the quality of their life, which often geographically means that they're now in a different place and they stay in that different place, very much like Groundhog Day, after they've had that experience. Great. A really lighthearted question before I think we move to Joe's final question. Mm -hmm. What are your favorite bits of Elf? The soundtrack is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Also, what I liked as well, uh, that burgeoning relationship with Zoe uh, Daskinel. And, and he's in the store and, and she is just so kind of, she's somebody who's, you know that she's perhaps fallen on hard times. We don't know much about her love life, but we know that she's looking for somebody really pure and good for her, somebody that she deserves. And she finds him perhaps in the most unexpected of places. And, and their relationship, obviously, is a strange one in many ways, mm -hmm. because it's the, it's the meeting of two different species in a way, because he doesn't quite realise he's human but actually what works so well in that is this concretization geographically in the case of new york of this festive sort of spirit that it's it, it's transplanting the santa myth to a very real and believable new york city because you asked me earlier kate if i've ever been to new york mm -hmm. and i haven't but in watching that film i i feel that i've kind of been taken on a, on a sleigh ride there this is what christmas films are often very good at doing they give us the geography they give us the place there was actually a film with uh nicholas cage called trapped in paradise it was deemed to be so poor it was released in february in 1995 in the uk i saw it at the cinema it's, it's a wonderful life story they go to a town called guess what paradise and they want to rob a bank but if they actually rob the bank then they feel guilty about it and they return the money and then actually they change their ways and all the rest of it but again it's the community it's a very real place it's a very it's the tangibility of it that kind of works and that's how i feel mm. about elf it's giving us a real location and and letting the christmas spirit enter that location and making us feel really gooey and good and and you know afterwards mm. I love that you went to Buddy and Jovi's relationship as one of your favorite bits of Elf because I think they have one of the best meet cute dialogues in cinema. So meet cute is when the two love interests first meet each other. And in this film, it happens in Gimbal's a department store and Buddy shows up at Santa's workshop, which is where they're going to have kids greet Santa. And he meets Jovi there for the first time. And the dialogue exchange is just brilliant. Are you enjoying the view? You are very good at decorating that tree. Why are you messing with me? Did Krampa put you up to this? I'm not messing with you. It's just nice to meet another human who shares my affinity for elf culture. Yeah, and I think that this film does New York just so perfectly. It just mm -hmm. really encapsulates New York City. So I like that you feel like, even though you haven't been there at Christmas, that you connect to it through the film because as a New Yorker, I also think it's just one of the best depictions of New York. Returning to this idea of the meat cute, I really like Zoe Deschanel's character Jovi. Her character brings a, a many characters who occupy the real world a certain cynicism. Yeah. And she doesn't believe Buddy and Walter Hobbs doesn't believe Buddy is who he says he is. And even Santa, this has kind of rubbed off on him a bit as well, which uh, some of Ed Asner's greatest scenes Mm -hmm. uh, where he threatens Buddy when he's found in the park, back off slick, like this great line read. So there's this like cynicism almost of the real world. They don't believe that Buddy is just very sincere. He just wants to share the Christmas spirit. He's not out to make money off anyone or anything like this. Almost everyone he meets comes away better from his childhood innocence. And small interactions of just these children to people on work release working in the mailroom to just everyone seems to come away from meeting someone who is very genuine and sincere and is all about Christmas. And that uplifts them and makes them better people almost as well. So there's this just runs throughout the film. And I think New York Works is quite a good backdrop for that because everyone is like, really, this guy? <laughs> this, this, <laughs> You know, there's that healthy dose of uh, 
maybe cynicism is too far, but that looking slightly uh, sceptically at something like this guy turning up. I think one of the scenes that captures what you're talking about so well, Joe, is when the music is playing and Buddy is running and he crosses a street and the taxi cab hits him <laughs> and the music stops perfectly on cue there. Just to, It's like that record scratch moment and he kind of writes himself and then keeps going and the taxi just drives on. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and blows the horn at him. It's just yeah. like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, wait, I want to throw one last thing in mm -hmm. on the topic of our favorite things about Elf. We've already mentioned Gimbal, so that's the shop that they have the meet cute in because that's where Jovi is working and where Buddy ends up working for a bit. And I just absolutely love that it's Gimbal's. Mm. Apparently, when they were making the movie, they wanted it to be Macy's. But Macy's refused the permission. And that's because Macy's famously has the real Santa. And the reason on Miracle on 34th Street, Macy's is the main department store in that movie mm -hmm. is because in that movie, Macy's, the department store, ends up having the real Santa. And that's what hmm. they've stuck to ever since. And the primary point of competition that Macy's is facing in Miracle on 34th Street is Gimbel's, which was another department store in New York City that went out of business in the 1980s. Mm. So the fact that Elf resurrects Gimbel's for this film when they couldn't get Macy's on board, I think is just brilliant mm -hmm. because it plays this really lovely little homage to New York history, but also to a very classic Christmas movie, Miracle on 34th Street. Anyway, just yeah, yeah. love that little detail. A great little nod to movie history. Maybe Macy's weren't happy with this line, you sit on a throne of lies and the Santa is oh, exposed. Oh, Macy's absolutely <laughs> would never have accepted yeah. anybody saying that to Fun. their Santa. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so one final substantive question. Usually with many religions, there's often some kind of official or a particular set of practices that guides what you should do when you're doing whatever this religious thing is. But it strikes me that this isn't necessarily the case with Christmas. So much of what we do tends to be made up over time and it can change really fluidly and might just be something your family does. It's almost like you're just the ultimate authority over what particular rituals you choose to do every year. So I'm wondering, Chris, if you have any thoughts about the diffuse nature of these Christmas rituals and routines without this clear authority or set of practices. I'm always intrigued as to what people are celebrating at Christmas because, and I'm guilty of this as well, don't get me wrong, but people will put up their trees and I, I suppose we have our work parties. I suppose there is that sense that for a lot of people, it's simply a time to say, OK, we need to press that reset button. We need to maybe re-emerge or, you know, find our family again. I was joking with somebody the other day often, you know, and you see this in Christmas films. What's the best thing about Christmas family? What's the worst thing about Christmas family? You know, that you go through these, these rituals every yeah. year, but we have to go through them. We can't separate ourselves from them. But there is a sense here that it's it's a continually changing tradition because I know plenty of people, mm -hmm. including in my own family, who will say Christmas, oh, it's nothing to do with religion. Others who, of course, will say, well, of course, it's all about Christianity. And yet, when you then point to these films, they have their own mythology, as we've been discussing here. The elf is, is seen to be kind of a, a template in many ways. I mean, it, when it came out in 2003, it's building on films from before. But people now often mm -hmm. see it as, for a lot of people, it's the archetypal Christmas movie. That's the benchmark against which others can be made. I see Christmas is a very fluid construction. And I think for a lot of people, it is that chance maybe to, to do things that the rest of the year, we, in a very busy life, we don't have the chance to do. And we mean it. And we don't always succeed, but we always return the following year and try and get it right the next time. And we can never get out of that cycle, nor do we try to. When I was a student, we'd have Christmas parties at university or we Christmas dinners, and we'd never have any Christmas music played. I remember once being quite excited that they played The Human League's Don't You Want Me, which was the Christmas number one in 1981. And I thought, well, at least it was number one at Christmas time. So therefore, you know, that's the closest to Christmas. Whereas these days, and we, we might think it all a bit tacky, but we will listen to all those, those Christmas favourites. And I heard them on the radio this morning as I was driving into work. So I think that those traditions yeah. kind of mutate and they change, they augment. But crucially, if anything, they get bigger than they were mm. 20, 30 years ago. Christmas feels longer than it was 20 or 30 years ago. 
So, so I, I, I'm intrigued as to what people are actually celebrating and whether people claim to be Christian or not as to exactly what is the essence of Christmas and where it can be found. And, and I've certainly found in Christmas films an interesting sight of something. It's certainly a sight of religiosity. But the question is, what is its relationship to the mainstream, inverted commas, Christian celebration and festival? So mm. do you think that we can draw any understanding about modern religion from what you're talking about? about how Christmas is a kind of make your own traditions change over time thing that people do. Yeah, and I think it comes down to this importance of family and the sacrality of family. And and and, and actually, I think it's using the economy as a means towards that aim. If you haven't got any money, then, then you have trouble. But if you right. but if you do, it's how you spend it and whether you then use it appropriately and wisely to show your love. And of course, anonymous present giving as well, in the sense that you, you tell your children that Father Christmas gave the presents. You spent all this money on them, but then you deny that you actually gave them the presents. So there's an element of, of sacrifice almost in that, the sort of, you know, I love you so much, I bought all these things for you. But of course, Father Christmas actually gave it to you. So, right. so there are all these uh, ingredients, I think, at the heart. That's lovely. It's been a really, really fun conversation. But before we let you go, we'd love for you to pitch us a pairing. This can be anything, anything at all that you would pair with the film Elf. Maybe a drink, a food, another movie, a book, an article, anything that would make your Christmas wish list. Well, as somebody who does need no excuse at this time of year to watch ridiculous amounts of Christmas movies, mm -hmm. I think what I would probably want to do is pair it with other Christmas films because a lot of people know Elf and that's the one that everybody talks about. I've touched on a few others there. Not necessarily brilliant films. I mentioned Trapped in Paradise. I mentioned the Disney film One Magic Christmas. I probably would be interested to say, if you like Elf and the ingredients there, maybe try out something that maybe didn't do quite so well at the box office, but it's got the same ingredients there and maybe touch people's hearts in a different generation. So I'd be inclined to sort of try and check some of those out as well, because Elf for me was wonderful. But I mean, I was in my 30s just, I think I had just turned 30 when I saw it. But so many people growing up who are younger than me sort of see that as the benchmark. And I, and I just think there are lots of other films along the way that actually I think would be well worth the effort. Perfect. I've never seen Trapped in Paradise, so I definitely have a movie to watch. Thank you for the recommendation. Pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us, Chris. Thank you for just sharing a lot of your work with us. And your book is available from Oxford University Press. Christmas is Religion, Rethinking Santa, the Secular and the Sacred. Came out in 2016. Makes a perfect Christmas gift available from Oxford University yes, Press. Yes, <laughs> it does. I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. So if that's a good recommendation for any of our listeners. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'd like to just wish our listeners a very happy holiday whatever you celebrate, however you celebrate. Hope it's restful and meaningful and you have a good new year. Merry Christmas. Ho, ho, ho. Go Yule. <laughs> now get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. See you in the new year. That's our show today. Gods and Movie Makers is researched and produced by us, Joe Scales and Katie Turner and supported by listeners like you. Our music is by Style the Kid. As always, you can check out what we're doing on our socials at GodMovPod. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard today, head on over to our website, GodsAndMovieMakers.com, where you can donate to us or subscribe for additional content. Thanks for listening. Merry Christmas. Bye, buddy. <laughs>